certainly thankful to be before you once again. Certainly thankful to have each of you out here present with us in the audience, at least physically here, and likewise for all those who might be listening on the internet. If you would recall, the past few times I've been up here speaking, we've dealt with our origin. The creation week is found in Genesis chapter 1 and the first part of chapter 2. I would like to take this block of time this morning to use it for our fourth and final installment dealing with this issue, but primarily focusing on the errors that men have devised to attack God's Word. And you will see to not only that, but to attack His very nature, to unseat Him as our mighty Creator. So like we've stated, we've, we've considered the first week of creation, the first week of existence or of all things physical. We noted that there must be a first cause and that cause must be uncaused, whatever it might be. We have concluded that that cause, by necessity, is Jehovah God. Now to those who would compromise, we might refer to them as fence riders, various other things. Either way, they are compromisers. To them, evolution is a fact, is established fact in their mind. Therefore, they must be able to, at least in their own minds, try to reconcile Scripture with evolution. They must mo make God mold around science. Now, in order for this to occur, a, quote, reevaluation of the of book of Genesis must happen. And their attacks of validity are fourfold. They claim that there are multiple creation accounts. Then they attempt to add time before the creation week. They attempt to add time during the creation week. And they attempt to add time after the creation week. After all, those are the only options. So we consider our first point. Are there actually two creation accounts? Now they would cite... Of course, Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through the second chapter of Genesis there in verse 3. That's the first Genesis account of creation. Then they would cite Genesis chapter 2, verses 4 through 25 as being the second creation account. The theistic evolutionist considers this the higher critical viewpoint. Their words, not mine. They claim that these two passages show two differing writing styles. Therefore, there must be two different authors. They, they claim that there were multiple ancient writers with one editor, and they refer to this as the documentary hypothesis. They cite as their, quote, evidence, the use of mainly two different words, beginning with, and that would be Elohim and Yahweh. We see the use of Elohim in Genesis chapter 1 and Yahweh in Genesis chapter 2 verse 4. We point out that Elohim typically suggests strength, unity. Points to God as the mighty creator. And we see that Yahweh typically suggests the moral and spiritual nature of deity. And since there are these multiple titles, there also, of course, is literary variety in these writings. But I would like for us to consider disproving these things. We'll start out with Genesis chapter 28, verse 13. We'll, we won't read that entire verse, but enough of it to point the disregard for God and really the entire scriptures. Now, I'm not going to read it as it is read in the King James. I'm going to read a little bit slightly with the Hebrew terms used, but in English. So Genesis chapter 28, verse 13, it says, I am Yahweh. 
Elohim of Abraham, thy father, and Elohim of Isaac. Well, since we use two different words here for the same God, there must have been two writers of this one sentence, right? In keeping consistent with this higher critical mindset. John J. Davis, in his book, Paradise to Prison, Studies in Genesis, had this to say. To conclude that differences in style or vocabulary unmistakably indicate different authors is invalid for any body of literature. It is well known that a single author may vary his style and select vocabulary to fit the themes he is developing and the people he is addressing. It goes without saying that a young graduate student's love letter will vary significantly in vocabulary and style from his research paper. I might further add to that, my English essays might have referred to different uses of vocabulary and a different style within the same paper. It's just nonsense. They also claim that these two accounts conflict over creation. They look at the order as well as the deity concepts found therein, and they try to pit them against each other. They say Genesis chapter 1 shows God as a transcendent being. They then point out to Genesis chapter 2 and its uses of anthropomorphisms, personifications, if you, if you will, thus implying an inferior status to God. They cite such words as formed, breathed, and planted. Those are anthropomorphisms. And to use them for God, I guess, to them in their mind is talking about two different gods. That's exactly what they attempt to say. However, these critics do not realize, or rather they turned a blind eye to the fact that there are similar terms used in Genesis chapter 1. In Genesis chapter 1 verse 8 it says God called. In verse 12 he says God saw. In verse 1 of chapter 2 it says God rested. These are human terms. These are anthropomorphisms as well. Genesis chapter 2 verse 4 they claim uses reverse older language thus implying two writers. Well, let's read that. Genesis chapter 2, verse 4 says, These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth, when they were created, in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Wow. Two writers, right? That's what they'd claim. I would suggest to you that really that verse sets the context for what's going on afterward. We would note and point out that there are, in fact, differences, but there is purpose behind those differences. We consider Genesis chapter 1, it is a broad, chronological outline. When you look at Genesis chapter 2, specifically 4 through 25, it is much more of a special, topical emphasis. But we must keep in mind that who wrote the Bible and for what purpose did it or was it written? Well, certainly God authored it by use of human hands. We must also know that the purpose of the Bible is to unfold man's history and to show man's reconciliation to his creator. Therefore, we would expect the focus of the second chapter to change viewpoints. We see Genesis chapter 1, creation up until man. Then we see chapter 2 with emphasis on man. Are we really surprised by this? We also point to Jesus in Matthew chapter 19 verses 4 through 5. We typically use this passage for marriage and rightfully so for in fact it deals with that. Jesus said and he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? By the way, that's quoting Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. And, and said in verse 5 there, it says, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. That comes from Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. Clearly, Jesus did not endorse the documentary hypothesis. After all, who would know better than the very word of God who brought it all into existence? 
Secondly, we consider how the attempts are made of adding time before creation. This is typically referred to as the gap theory. Now there are quite a wide variety of variations to this theory, but the most consistent view is that original creation existed as noted in Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, but that occurred billions of years ago. They point out that in this telling of the story, Satan rebelled against God and was then cast from heaven. This resulted in a cataclysmic event that destroyed all life on the earth. George H. Pember, who wrote Earth's Earliest Ages, points this out. Hence we see that geological attacks on scripture are altogether wide of the mark, or a mere beating of the air. There is room for any length of time between the first and second verses of the Bible. Since we have no inspired account of the geological formations, we are at liberty to believe that they were developed in the order we find them. What a complete disrespect for God's word and how authority is transferred from God to us through words. They point out that the, the Hebrew word bara and Asa are used to mean two separate things. Bara deals with ex nihilo creation and they, they would like to attempt to say that Asa refers to a recreation, something being made over. You see, they believe that God, bara creation in Genesis 1 verse 1, and then Asa creation in Genesis 1 verse 2. So he created it to begin with. Satan rebelled and had to, then God had to destroy everything in existence. And then verse 2 comes along, okay, I have to remake everything. That's the gap theory. Then they point out that the, the term or the phrase without form and void. Tohu wabahu. And they say that it can only refer to something that is what was once in repair, but now ruined. It's a little bit of a lengthy quote, but I like to read it from John C. Whitcomb. He states this, Many Bible students, however, are puzzled with the statement in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, that the earth was without form and void. Does God create things that have no form and are void? The answer, of course, depends on what those words mean. Without form and void, translate the Hebrew expression tohu wabahu, which literally means empty and formless. In other words, the earth was not chaotic, not under a curse of judgment. It was simply empty of living things and without the features that it later possessed, such as oceans and continents, hills and valleys, features that would be essential for man's well-being. When God created earth, this was only the first state of a series of stages leading to its completion. Now that's not very difficult to understand. Now my personal favorite of this specific theory is they claim that there was a pre-Adamic race. Naturally there'd have to be if there was a creation before Genesis chapter 1 verse 2. They claim that there was humankind prior to the Adam race, to Adam and Eve, all of which died after the casting out of Satan and his rebellion. They point to the fossil record and say that there, these fossils indeed do exist, and they, they point out rightfully that there was death, there was disease, and there was ferocity. We point out from Pember once more, says, Since then, the fossil remains are those of creatures anterior before the atom, and ye show evident token of disease, death, and mutual destruction. They must have belonged to another world and have a sin-stained history of their own. Now I'd like for us to consider some issues with this theory bigger issues than I think they realize. You see, as we've noted prior, that each of these attacks is a direct attack on God, His very nature. We noted throughout each day of creation 
that God pronounced a title on those days. He looked on his creation. He said, it is good. And then after the sixth day, he said, it's very good. If it is the case that this pre-Adamic race existed from Genesis 1-1 and then was later wiped out, and the fossils were left behind to point to that existence of this pre-Adamic race, how could God refer to his made-over creation as good? He could not. You see, this is a direct conflict with New Testament teaching, aside from the Old Testament teachings. We note in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 21, Romans chapter 5, verse 12, and Romans chapter 8, verses 20 through 22, death entered the world through Adam when he sinned. It was not before Adam sinned. It was at the point when Adam sinned. You see, if there's this pre-Adamic race, God said death is good. Separation from your, your spirit is good. Separation from God the Father is a good thing. That's what he's saying in all these different verses throughout chapter 1, if the gap theory is true. Therefore, God is a liar. Because he is calling sin a good thing. We also ask the question, was Adam really the first man? Paul, by the inspiration, says, 1 Corinthians 15, 45, that he indeed was the first man. The gap theory disagrees. Well, the gap theory is wrong. Third, we'd like to point out their attempts to add time during the creation week. Now, this is starting to gain a little bit more popularity. I've seen, at least, anyway. <clears throat> this is typically recalled or referred to as the day-age theory. Nowadays, I'm starting to see it referred to as the old earth creationists. You might say they're trans-creationists. All they're trying to do, again, is to wed evolution to God. Dr. Donald England, from his book, A Christian View of Origins, says this, but why do so many people insist that the earth is relatively recent in origin? First, I feel that it is because one gets the general impression from the Bible that the earth is young. It is true that the biblical chronology leaves one with a general impression of a relatively recent origin of man. Dr. Jack Wood Sears would later add to that in his book, Conflict and Harmony in the Science and the Bible, Science has seemed to indicate that life has been here much longer than we have generally interpreted the Bible to indicate. Therein lies the problem. Later he would state, uniformitarian dating methods take precedence over the Bible. Well, I'm just glad he came out and said that. Because that's exactly what he believes. You see, the day-age theory, and those who attempt to promote it, claim that Genesis 1 was not literal. It was more of a metaphor. And instead of literal 24-hour periods, each day represented millions or possibly billions of years of time. Now, this theory is becoming more popular with those who would claim to be Christians. They might not specifically believe in evolution, but they do know, at least from what folks have been telling them, that the earth is extremely old. We have all these different tests that really don't mean much of anything, but they point to an older earth. So you must believe it or you're an idiot. That's really the rhetoric that these folks are using. You're too dumb enough to interpret real data, so let us, the scientists, tell what it is for you and then you can believe it if not we're going to kick you out of really the academic field however these individuals seek to reconcile paleontology with the bible account but we would note the days of creation not should be accepted but must be accepted because they are literal 24 hour periods of time it's been said recently that those little words have meaning. Don't run them over. 
Well, we're going to employ one of those little words now. Yom, the Hebrew word yom. Now, as with many words, they determine or their meaning is determined by the context that they're found in. So this word yom can refer to longer periods of time, to ages even, sort of not eons, but longer periods of time. However, any and every time that yom is used with a cardinal number, one, two, three, four, or an ordinal number, first, second, third, or fourth, it always refers to a 24-hour period, what we would refer to as a day. But if that wasn't enough, God uses language to point out that these were 24-hour periods of time. It's an interesting thought to consider, especially because it's a little bit backwards from what we gauge days as, but he says the evening and the morning were the first day, second day, third day. Well, this is how the Israelites of old measured their days from sunset to sunset. This would include an entire day from evening to morning. But if the day-age theory is true, did Adam live to see the seventh day? Because we're talking about millions of years here. So Adam had to have been millions of years old if he lived to see the seventh day of creation. Then we'd like to note Exodus chapter 20 verses 8 through 11. We're told, it says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt do any work, thou nor thy son nor thy daughter, thy manservant nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that, is, that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Well, if, if I have to work six days, but days really mean eons, I have to work for, let's say, six million years, because we'll say a day is really a million years in the day-age theory. I have to work six million years, and then I get a million years off. How much sense does that make? These Israelites were expected to work six literal days and have a literal day off. We understand that. We work for the weekend. And some folks might not actually get the weekends off. Maybe one day they will. Point is, if you're going to say a day in creation is eons of time, it must be true every time it's referenced throughout Scripture. Because that's indeed what is being referenced here. In Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11, primarily verse 11. I would not want that work schedule. Thankfully, the day-age theory is false. Now we point to their attempts to add time after creation. We must look to the apparent age of the earth. Well, they would like to say, well, since it looks old, it must be old. Well, if it looks young, it must be young. Well, the fact is, the, air, the, the earth does, in fact, look old. But millions of years old, billions of years old, as we keep the creation week in mind, we must realize and note that God created mature beings. He did not create an acorn that would later grow into an oak tree. He created the oak tree. He did not make an egg to hatch and to make a bird, you know, hatch out of it. Likewise, he did not make an infant. He made a mature human. Well, at least he made Adam, and he was physically mature. You see, creation was able to reproduce after its own kind. Any infant stage of any type of species would not be able to do that. We understand that by observation. We also see in Genesis chapter 1, verse 14, that God prescribes the purpose of the different lights added to the heavens. He says, therefore, signs and for seasons... 
we would like to note the following quote. Here then is an important piece of information that should, be, should not be overlooked. In order for the heavenly bodies to be used to, to man for designation of signs, seasons, days, and years, those heavenly bodies must have been visible. In other words, when God created them, he made their light visible from the earth. The psalmist exclaimed, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. There was, therefore, purpose behind God's mature creation. Well, did the heavens declare the glory of God at every point of their existence? Certainly they did. We would also like to point out, and I think this could be a, a hang-up for certain people, and it's been asked before, did God place fossils to make the earth appear older than it is? I think that is a relevant question, but I think it's certainly one that points to some ignorance. Well, we're going to get rid of that today. We see in James chapter 1, verse 13, that God does not solicit any man to sin. We know from Titus chapter 1, verse 2, that God cannot lie. Not just does not. He cannot lie. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33, says God is not the author of confusion. If He placed these fossils in the earth... He would be the God of confusion. Because some might say, well, the earth is older than it appears. Here are the fossils that prove that to be the case. And you might have some, some folks on the other side of the fence that say the, uh, the direct opposite. Well, folks, these two different parties cannot be right at the same time, holding to those two different beliefs. Romans chapter 1, verse 20, points to the fact that that we as creatures must discern our Creator through creation. It's been stated before that the natural world is general revelation and that the Bible is special revelation. You see, everything around us in this physical world points to a designer. I can come to the knowledge of God just by going outside and looking and using these optic nerves of mine to the best of my ability to observe certain things in this world. But that's not going to get me to heaven. I need that special revelation, God's very word to reconcile myself to Him. So God did not place these fossils to give a false appearance of age. To do so would violate His very nature. As we've stated before, we must realize and understand that there are only two possibilities to explain the origin of our existence. Naturalistic forces as outlined by evolutionists, humanistic upholders, these things cannot explain our origin. That they do not, but they cannot. It's impossible for them to do that. Theistic evolution attempts to wed God to evolution. They try to mold God into the, the mold of humanistic science. To evolution. Simply cannot be done. As we've said, this attempt is in direct conflict with the very nature of the Creator. We also know that from Romans chapter 1, specifically verse 20, that we as His creation are without excuse. We should know better. You know, you tell your children... You know, I taught you better than that. You know better than to act that way. Well, God can say the same thing to us. We have physical creation. We can observe. God has given us properly working minds to logically come to a conclusion that is warranted by the evidence. And if we don't, whose fault is it? It's our fault. We are, our, we are without excuse. Now, I certainly hope that these lessons have helped in fortifying your foundation regarding origins. But we do need to keep in mind 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 10 through 12. 
You see, we're told that those who would receive not the love of the truth would believe a lie. That makes sense because if I leave the truth, the only thing left to turn to is a lie. If I leave spring, I'm going to the woodlands. I can't be in both places at once. Most of the time we understand that. We might not like it, but we cannot be fence riders. As it's been said before, even Satan owns the fence. So you must pick a side. You're either right or wrong in, in God's eyes. Don't fall into the trap that many would lay today for those who profess to be Christians. Whether you are in fact a Christian or you're just saying so because you want the attention, the popularity. Science is laying traps for us and we must be forewarned. Be forewarned is to be forearmed. Now we said before that general revelation, the very nature, physical nature that we see around us, points to God. But we know that that cannot save us from our sins. It must be the very word of God that does that. In fact, it is. The only way we're able to contact the blood of our Savior is through baptism. But we must be a candidate for that baptism before we actually commit that act. You've heard a little bit of God's word this morning. Romans 10, 17. I hope we've pointed out a plenty of evidence for you to understand that there is something else out there. I'm not just flesh and bone. When I die and leave this flesh, there is a, a spirit that will be left behind and it's going to go to one of two places. Ultimately, either heaven or hell. Now, that should scare every single one of us. But it should also cause us to grow our faith. John 8, 24. Ultimately, we must repent of our sins. Acts three nineteen. Then we must confess Christ before others. Romans 10, verses 9 and 10. And then ultimately, we must be baptized for the remission of those sins. Acts 22, verse 16. Now, if you would like to become a Christian this morning take the time to do so however if you are a child of God but through process of time and, and weakness you've allowed sin to creep back into your life please take care of that this morning as together we stand and sing